I have no training in finance or economics. I'm purely self-taught. Um, that said, I now write one of the most influential financial blogs in the country, and um, lots of bankers and undesirables um, email me, and they wouldn't if I was talking gibberish. Uh, in addition to which, everything I will tell you, um, uh, I can provide you with the citations, and um, those of you who have way too much spare time, I'm sure you will do, I invite you to go and look at the citations, don't take my word for it. If there's any lesson out of this financial crisis, it's please don't take anyone's word for anything. Um, I have some of them with me, um, and I'm happy to tell you what they are. Um, I mean, talk about the death of democracy seems to me to be one of those sort of way over the top things that, um, that earnest teenagers talk about. Uh, and I wish it was an exaggeration. However, I hope at the end of this talk that you'll perhaps think I wasn't exaggerating. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things, one of which you will probably know about, the trade deals, and two which you won't. Um, and those are the things nested inside the trade deals. Um, the reason I think it's important for you to know about something which on the surface of it seems so arcane is because I think we've all grown up in democracies, in a democracy, and I do think, and I, I've talked all, in, um, this is about the eighth place that I've given this talk, I think everyone thinks that having, if you're born into a democracy, there's the feeling that, well, it's, it's the natural order of things. We've got this far. Well, I mean, what could go wrong, as they say? Um, plenty. Um, none of us had to actually shed any blood to be able to vote. Because it was done by our forefathers and foremothers. It already happened. Um, but and democracy is very hard to get. You only have to look at the news. However, it's extremely easy to give it away. And that is what is happening now. The trade agreements, I think you've probably all heard of the trade agreements, the ones in the news, the, the TPP in America, the TTIP, which is the one between America and Europe, um, and then there's a thing called CETA, which was between uh, Canada and Europe, and then there's one you probably haven't heard of, uh, which will be probably worse than the TTIP, it's called TISA. It's being negotiated now behind closed doors, it's called the Trade in Service Agreement. And it will make all of the, the um, uh, bank regulations, which our politicians have been talking about, all oh, this will, will, will rein them in this way and will lower votes. All of those things will be made irrelevant by TISA. Very little of the text has been made available. There are a few bootleg copies around, and it's a disaster on steroids. You will have no control over the financial services once TISA goes through. So anyway, I thought I'd start the good news. Um, trade agreements, right. Um, the thing about the trade agreements is they do um, what governments have always been wanting to do. Um, they want to uh, lower trade tariffs, they want to um, uh, bring every nation's uh, regulations into line. And when you, when you run through the list of things they want, you think, well, okay. Um, However, the trade agreement that we are concerned with, the TTIP, um, if you look at submissions from the Americans, they've made it very clear what they want. What they want to do is get access to European agriculture and agricultural products. In return, what the Europeans are arguing for is they want to have more access to American financial markets for our derivatives. I'm sure it's desperately important to you to know that European derivatives will make it into America. That's what they're arguing. Um, what the Americans have said very clearly is they don't like the way that Europe based, is based on the precautionary principle. The Americans are based on quite the opposite. Uh, what I mean by the precautionary principle is the laws governing the treatment of animals and what you eat is based on if a company wants to sell you something or, or provide you with something that, run, that is handed in a particular way, they have to prove that it is not <coughs> <coughs> That's the essence of the precautionary principle. In America, the, the principle is it's considered safe unless the authorities can prove it isn't. Which, given that, none of the nations employ very many people to do that. They rely on the, the company's data. Um, 
there is very little likelihood that a government is going to be able to say, we're not having that, and win. Um, to give you an example, uh, this is from, I think, the late 90s. Uh, Canada took exception to uh, an additive in petrol called MMT, um, which was manufactured, the sole supply was at Ethelcorp, which is an American company. And Canada um, banned it because of on both health and environmental grounds. They said it was carcinogenic, it was very unpleasant. Um, and they were taken to uh, arbitration. I'll tell you exactly how arbitration works a little later. And the uh, Ethel Court said they can't possibly know that it's bad environmentally and health-wise because they don't have all the data, they don't have the right science. Uh, so um, they, haven't got the, they can't prove it. And the arbitration came down on the side of Ethical. And Canada had to apologise in writing to Ethel Corp and reinstate it and pay them $13 million. Okay. Um, so they want in the, in the TTIP to do a couple of things. The Americans are very unhappy with the Corp principle in general. They also don't like a country of, label, of origin label. Uh, they don't like the idea that comes, someone could say, well, wait a minute, that comes from America or Israel. Canada or you know, wherever, I don't want to buy it. They don't like this. They don't want to have any labeling that says GMO free. Uh, they don't want you to have that choice. Uh, and they would also like to overturn the ban on GMO food. Those are the, the, some of their top priorities. And if you go to, if you look up any of the submissions from the Americans, you'll see that black and white. Um, so that's what they want. But they've been wanting that kind of thing for ages. When you go back to look at the previous sort of incarnation of um, corporations saying, how do we get our way? Um, if you go back to the, to the 90s and noughties, it was a big World Trade Organization. Remember the big anti-globalization things in, in um, Seattle? The trade agreement, the TTIP, is not at all the same thing as those agreements that you remember people getting hot under the collar about. Right? Those old trade agreements, the World Trade Organization, and all of those global um, agreements are a completely different animal. They are the way we tr the corporations used to do it, tried to do it. The problem with them is they are negotiated between sovereign nations and lots of sovereign nations. So it's a bit like herding cats. You've got to get all of these governments, all of whom are prey to their electorate. Terrible idea, obviously. Mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and so it takes forever. And if, if you go and look at the submissions, and if this, particularly if you look at some of the letters, it's very clear that the corporations say we have just lost faith in this. We just, it's never going to, it's never going to work. It's never going to happen. Hello, the TTIP tour. Yeah. Please, you haven't missed the, word. the company said, look, this is this is not going to work. We have to go to our sovereign nation and say, please, could you go and shout at China on our behalf because they're, they're, they've got steel tariffs. It's so unwieldy. And it doesn't work. It hasn't worked from the point of view of the corporations. First of all, they've got to lobby their government. They've got to get that lobbying above and beyond any changes of government that might happen. Uh, they've got to fend off other democratic elements. And then the other nation just finds ways around it. There are judgments that are eight years old and they haven't actually been enforced yet. So basically, from the mid-90s, while the mainstream media was still focusing on the World Trade Organization, corporations had said that, fine, yeah, fine. We're not interested. And they moved to uh, a new way of solving this problem. And the problem is a very simple one. When you've got your government and your legislatures to say, we want this to happen, how do you make a government, how do you make a sovereign nation do it? How do you force them to do it? And there is no mechanism in the old World Trade Organization way. It's just vast amounts of words, and the enforcement mechanism isn't there. The trade agreements, there is that mechanism. And the people who solved it were the people who drafted NAFTA. And there were sort of three main drafters, of course, I can't remember their names. But you can pin them down to a couple of people. Um, and what they did is they, they took this, the same kind of list of corporate demands <coughs> that you had in the World Trade Organization, and they married it to something called Bilateral Investment Treaty. Please do not be worried by the jargon. The jargon is there the way that 
that Latin used to be there in, in, in the Catholic Church, to make you feel stupid. So that you go, if you try and raise your hand, someone goes, you know, speak Latin, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and they're trying that same crap again. Um, the story of, the, of these um, um, trade agreements is like Russian dolls. There's the trade agreement you've heard of, the TTIP. Inside that, get rid of the outside doll, there's a thing called a bilateral investment treaty. Right? That's the doll we're talking about now, and there's one more inside that. Bilateral investment treaty was an obscure bit of international law. The first one was negotiated between uh, Germany and Pakistan in 1959. Bilateral investment treaties are not agreements between statesmen. They are not diplomatic agreements. They are international law. That's very important because it means that once you've signed a trade agreement and signed, therefore, the thing inside it, it is now no longer anything to do with your elected officials. It now passes into the hands of the lawyers who, in our case, work for the Foreign and Commonwealth. That's a major breakthrough for the corporations. It now doesn't matter who is in number 10 and what letters you send to number 10 or how many petitions, none of it gets to the Foreign Commonwealth Office, which is where it's happening now. Okay. Um, the, the bilateral investment treaties, I'll tell you in a moment exactly what they say, but they've always been the school bit. They started in 1959. No one had really heard about anything about until 1986, because until 1986, no case had been brought on the basis of this little bit of international law. Um, ten years later, uh, there have been 38 <coughs> cases. By 2011, 450 cases. And globally, there are now over 3,000 of these bilateral investment treaties. This country has signed 80 or more. And they are simply an agreement which says it's an agreement between uh, um, two countries, bilateral investment treaty, which says um, it gives the global corporations, corporations from other countries, the right to sue your nation. And your companies can sue their nation. Right? It hands that right to global corporations. Your, your own um, corporations don't have that. Now, have you ever wondered why fracking in this country is done by French and Canadian companies, and why fracking in America is done by French and English companies, and in Australia the fracking is done by America? Why is it never done by our own country? <coughs> this is the reason. Right. Um, okay, so what the heck is a bilateral investment treaty, and, and you know who runs them? Um, the bilateral investment treaty has four parts. And there is a standard boilerplate. Uh, the standard boilerplate is now called the Model Law. It was drafted under the UN in 1986, I think. But, but essentially, it just goes back to that 1959. And it does four things. It says, no nationalization or expropriation of private corporations' assets by a nation. Two, foreign companies must get equal treatment to the companies of that country. The treatment must be fair and equitable. And in the case of dispute between the corporation and the, and, the, and the nation, the nation must accept arbitration of disputes. And that fourth point is the last Russian doll. It's the one that's the third one inside. It's called, some of you may have heard of this, the Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS. And that bit is the teeth and clause inside the trade agreement. I'll run through those four points, what they actually mean. No nationalisation and expropriation. If you, if you talk to one of the arbitration lawyers, the, they nearly always trot out the same example. And it was an example of um, an American company that set up a bat battery factory in Congo. And then there was a revolution, and I can't remember, it was either burnt down or they just took it over. And so the lawyers would say, that's terrible, isn't it? You know, you go along and you invest your millions and you build a battery factory and then some bugger just comes along and takes it away. It, it is reasonable that they should get some kind of recompense for that. However, you cannot leave a word like expropriation in the hands of international lawyers and expect it to have a happy ending. Expropriation now, now that 
quite a number of these cases have been thought, um, means you, you are guilty of expropriating from a company if the company says you have expropriated from us our reasonable expectation of future profits. Let me give you a concrete example. After Fukushima, there was such an outcry in Germany against, because they were already not quite sure about the nuclear, um, uh, nuclear power generation, there was a huge outcry, big public outcry, and the German government said, mm -hmm, okay, we'll, we'll just shut, at least for the moment, all of our nuclear reactors. Well, those nuclear reactors were owned by a Swedish company called Vattenfall. Vattenfall said, hang on, I don't give a damn what, what the population of Germany has said. You signed a bilateral agreement with Sweden, thank you very much, and uh, you have just expropriated from us the profits we were expecting to make in the next five years. So they took them to arbitration, and they won, and were awarded 700 million euros, which came straight out of the German taxpayers. I know, German taxpayers have a lot of money, but I think even they would have missed seven million. Um, that's what expropriation means now. And in the more recent literature, because I'm such an exciting fellow, this is what I spend my evenings reading, um, they are now saying, um, and I can find you this citation if you want, that they will consider it expropriation if a country brings in a level of tax which is outside of the reasonable international expectation. Who would like to guess who decides what was a reasonable international expectation? Thank you. No, no, yeah, I that pencil. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it, 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 is, it is now in the, the, the literature there and beginning to say, yes, we, if, if a company, if a, we set up, uh, we go into business in country X and then on the expectation that country X is going to sort of play by the rules and then country X decides they're going to have a 70% tax bracket. Well, that's not, that's not what we were expecting. And they want to have this notion that their expectations should take precedence over your democratic right to decide what you would like to do as sovereign citizens. 